This evening's lesson is entitled, in regards to prayer, the text comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 17, where Paul says, pray without ceasing. Now, obviously, if you take that in a very, very literal way, you'll be kneeling all the time, hands folded, head bowed, eyes closed, as you pray. And that's all you will do. Obviously, that's not what it means. I would suggest strongly that it, it, what it does mean is, is we should be always in a prayerful attitude. Um, Paul talk, I say Paul. Paul talks about offering up uh, words of praise from our lips at all times, reflecting back to the work of a, of a Levitical priest, that we should be in such a state that we're always ready to offer up a prayer and we are in such a way that when that prayer is offered, God hears it. Again, which is what the lesson is about. Now, the word pray, or some form of the word, takes up approximately five columns in my Strong's Concordance. And in my Knave's Topical Bible, there are about 15 pages dealing with prayer. I would say prayer is a fairly important subject in the Bible. Any good topical Bible has numerous headings and subheadings, and if you've got a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, you'll find such in there. Knave's Topical or whatever topical Bible you have, you'll find a bunch in there. They're discussing it from all kinds of aspects. Um, if you study, study prayer in the Bible, you know, somebody says, well, how should our physical form be? Should we always be kneeling in a corner in the closet with our eye? You know, well, I would say no. Um, if you've ever driven in any kind of traffic, you've offered prayers and your eyes were not closed, I would hope. Uh, if you do, do it in back of me <laughs> and then you're on your own. But prayer is important to both physical and spiritual life. Luke, Luke chapter 18, the, the first verse of Luke chapter 18 says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. So there's the idea that we should always be willing to pray, willing and able to pray, and that we should never become frustrated or, or hesitant in our prayer, that we should be strong in our prayers when we offer them. Um, in Hebrews chapter 3, I believe it is, last couple of verses, no, chapter 4, the last couple of verses, talks about in, entering into the throne room of grace and mercy. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying we as Christians do because of our relationship to God and our being sanctified priests. We enter into the throne room. Think about that. When we go to God in prayer, we enter into his throne room. And we speak to him directly. Well, obviously, we're doing it through the mediation of Jesus. But the, the illustration is we're entering into him personally. Now, obviously, that's a spiritualized context. But that's the effect of what we're doing when we pray. And as his children, as his faithful children, he's going to hear us. And again, we talk about that. That's talked about here in our lesson. But it is, important, it is an important privilege for the Christian. Now, it, listen, anybody can pray. But as we'll see in the lesson, a lot of prayers don't get past the overhead. Oh, how can that? You know, you're saying God's not aware. No, God's aware of everything. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about what God is aware of, as we'll see later what does God hear? Okay. But 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. In Proverbs, the writer says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. So anybody can pray. Not saying that you can't. But whose prayers does God hear? Again, we're not talking about, the, you, okay, there's Mama in line there at Walmart, and little Bobby is standing there, and he's got Mars bars right about here, okay? Mama, 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 she's tugging on Mama's pant leg. Mama, Mama, does Mom hear? Yes. Does Mom hear? No. I said no. Okay. Take care of that one. But the fact is, is that to answer that request for the Mars bar, the answer is no. Before they got in line, don't ask me for any candy. We're not getting candy. So, 
Jesus, some biblical examples of prayer. Jesus constantly prayed. At the beginning of his ministry, Luke says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heaven was open. He prayed. Uh, in choosing the apostles, again in Luke, Luke tells us, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. So before, and, and you will find as you go through the life of Christ in the gospel accounts that it, before any major event, any serious event, he prayed. And he prayed not just a brief prayer. He, he prayed all night long. That's a long prayer, a long prayer session. Um, the night of his betrayal in John 17, if you want the Lord's prayer, John 17 would actually be it. The one in Matthew is more of a model prayer, and we'll look, we'll look at that here in a moment. Prior to his arrest in Matthew 26, he prayed. On the cross he prayed, I would, I would guess. So any time and every time he prayed. There's no time that's not a good time to pray. Um, we were in, Pen no, in Kentucky, and one of, the, one of the ladies said, well, you know, I, I, up in Kentucky, you know, it's... it's you got to be careful with how you're driving because sometimes it's a ways down before you stop. And she said, would it, what if I said, oh, Lord, then? I said, well, I think that would be an appropriate prayer. I don't think that'd be taking the Lord's name in vain because sometimes that's all you've got a chance to say as you go over the edge. So, you know, uh, say what you can as you can and the Lord sort that thing out. And asking Jesus for instructions, the apostles saw the need. You know, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. And he gave them four, and after this manner pray ye, our Father who art in heaven. Now that's, you know, we, that's not the Lord's prayer, that's the model prayer that he said, you know, here's how you pray, here's the form it takes. Now obviously we can't ask for his kingdom to come because his kingdom has already come, so we don't pray that prayer, that part of it, I mean, and, and asking for it, but we can certainly pray for the spread of the borders of the kingdom. But the rest of that, you know, obviously is, well, it, it, it would apparently be obvious that those things we can ask for. The early church prayed. They continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Why? Well, they were just starting out on a big journey. And they needed to pray about that. Thank, uh, first of all, I'm thinking they thank God quite a lot for their forgiveness of the sins. First of all, when Peter was in prison, they had a prayer session. Acts chapter 12. The brethren got together in, in, in a particular house and they prayed. They prayed all night long. And as we'll see here shortly, that the prayer was answered. Paul prayed with the Ephesian elders, Acts, 2, uh, Acts 20 and verse 36. He prayed for them and their faithfulness, even though he just finished telling them, that out of your own number some shall rise up to draw away disciples after themselves. So he prayed for them. He prayed for the Cyprian brethren, Acts chapter 21. Again, you can go through the, the book of Acts alone and just find out where prayer was being offered and why and whom it was offered for and so forth. You know, I didn't include it in this lesson, but Paul, in one of his pastoral letters, I'm going to say it's Titus, Titus chapter, no, I want to say Titus chapter 2, that's not it. But he, he told the brethren to pray for kings and all those in power. He didn't say if you like them, if they were of your party, if they did the things you wanted. No, that's not what you pray for. You pray for that person. And you pray sincerely for that person. So that, again, peace may abound and the borders of the kingdom be spread. Because I would suggest that we're probably in for some rough seas as far as religion goes here in the next number of years. So what are the conditions for acceptable prayer? How do I know that when I pray, God will hear my prayers in the context of his faithful child and answering that faithful child? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot, that it cannot hear. But, so he's telling us, he hears the prayers of the unfaithful. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Well, he can hear, but he won't hear. Well, he's hearing, mama, mama, mama. Okay, he's hearing... But he's not going to answer. You get no candy. I think we can understand that. I would hope so. So, so how do I assure 
as a faithful Christian now, we're not talking about anybody, we're talking about faithful Christians. How can, well, although unfaithful Christians and non-Christians can, can take a lesson from this. Can I assure my prayers be answered? Well, first of all, you have to believe. Now, don't act as if that doesn't cut it at all. That's just absurd. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, yes, I'm being disrespectful. Well, we need to act as if God really exists. Oh, no, no, no. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, biblical faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, I have to seek him in the way he said to seek him. Come unto me, all ye labor in heaven and laid, and I'll give you rest. I have to seek Jesus the way Jesus said he is to be sought. I can't do just anything I want to do. He's very specific in how we approach him and how we gain, uh, how we gain access to him and through him and to the Father. Very, very specific about that. And, and it's very, very specific about, about this also. Now, just as an aside or an addition here, if you look at Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, he was a Gentile. He wasn't a member of the church. But if you read that account, the angel appears to Cornelius and says, your prayers have come up before God as a memorial. Now, again, if you read the account, Cornelius was about as close to being a righteous man as you could possibly get, and probably not being a righteous man in context of being a Christian, because he wasn't. But yet, that's the kind of heart that God wants to seek him. Now, it's beyond me to say that that somebody like that, that there's not a Cornelius out here in the community somewhere praying that prayer, praying of one sort or another, but has that kind of an attitude and that kind of a person. And it's just beyond me that God would not hear that, would not respond to that prayer in a positive way to put me or you in that person's way. And you don't know who that person is. I mean, you just don't know. Now, they don't walk around with Cornelius printed on their forehead. You've got to ask. And we've talked about that in times past. James chapter 1. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Lord, if you're there, oh no. No. It's going to bounce off the overhead as far as effectiveness goes. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Why? He doesn't have faith. He wavers in his faith. Now, granted, there are some, Lord, increase our faith. Okay, that's appropriate. Okay, I'm glad you asked, because here it comes. We need to pray according, uh, excuse me, have a respect for God's law. Why would God answer the prayer of a disrespectful person? Now, Sister Parker, I'm not asking for you to respond. But when you were teaching school and a, and, a, and a student with a disrespectful attitude asked you a question, I imagine that stare. <laughs> you know, <laughs> didn't get a smile. <laughs> I, I, I think it'd get very cold in there for a brief moment of time. Proverbs 28, 29. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. That's how God sees the prayers of the non-law abider. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So how, how pure do we need to be? Well, to the extent that we're not merely disregarding evil, we are hating evil. I, I hate every evil way. That's what the scriptures tells us. So we need to pray then according to God's will. Again, going back to the model prayer would be a good start for that. Matthew 6, Jesus says, for if ye forgive... No, I got ahead of myself there, didn't I? I surely did. Pray according to God's will, 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to and keeping with and harmony with, that's what according to, look according to up in your dictionary. I believe it's a prepositional phrase. And, and you'll find that's what it means. Uh, in, in harmony with his will, he heareth us. So again, as I said this morning, if you ask for Mercedes Benz because your friends all have Porsches, no, it's not going to work out that way. Um, you may get an old pair of sneakers. <laughs> just, just as to make a point. 
But we have to ask according to his will. We have to ask in harmony with his will. We have to ask for things that he wants, uh, for which he wants us to ask. We have to have the right attitude and faith. We have to have the right heart, dis, you know, hating evil and hating iniquity and not regarding it to be opposed to it. That's how we are. That's the kind of people that God will hear the prayers of. I mean, just according to what scriptures say. And then we have to have a willing, a heart that is willing to forgive. Jesus says, for if you give, forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this is not a, a, a sermon on repentance. But 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 10 tells us the conditions that God will forgive us under. That, it, that if we repent and ask his forgiveness, he's promised to do so. So if that's the conditions under which God will forgive a prayer, then uh, a sin, a trespass, then, then I have to assume, and I have no other reason not to, but I have to assume that that's what I must do if somebody comes to me and repents, then I forgive them. Now, we're not talking about a heart willing to forgive. Think about the prodigal son and think about the prodigal son's father. How did the father react when the son was coming down the road? He went to meet him with open arms and put a cloak on him and killed the fatted calf and had a feast, had a, had a, uh, a welcoming home party. That's the attitude we ought to have. And I, I just have this picture of this old man, every time he walked past the windows, I've said before, he looked out the window down the road to see if the sun was coming. When he was out in the field working, he'd look down the road to see if the sun was coming. When somebody came from that far country and he heard about it, I'm sure he sent somebody, if he didn't, just my opinion, you know, have you heard anything from a son? My boys went there. Have you heard anything from him? So, again, I just, I just can't imagine. If, I mean, I, as a father, that's what I would be doing. That's just, but that's just me now. So the, the willingness to forgive the sinner. As we said this morning, uh, seven times seven, Jesus said, nope, seven times 70. Now, that doesn't mean that's 490 times. That doesn't mean at 491 you're cut off. No, he's making a point. And, and Peter thought he was doing good. Seven times seven? No, no, seven times 70. Woo, that's a lot. So, does prayer work? Now, not the way you and I would like it to work. Abracadabra, alakazam, and the rabbit comes out of the hat. Elias believed it did. James chapter five, verse 16 through 18. Confess your faults one to another. I'm getting ahead of myself again. Okay, don't know why I have that down there. James chapter 5, 16 to 18. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Keep reading, Jean. Elias was a man, subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth fruit. So, sh should we pray? Well, Elias seemed to think so. Um, Hezekiah succeeded. The prophet came to him, you know, the man had a boil. And he was fixed to die. The prophet came to him and said, get the house in order, you're going to die. Hezekiah went to his room, got in his bed, turned his face to the wall and wept and, and said, listen, Lord, I've been a pretty good fellow. Lord heard his prayer before Nathan got out, out the front door. God told him to go back and, and fix him up. So he made a... A, um, a uh, ba not a bandage, of, of figs. I forget the word, the exact word he uses, but he made some figs. Poultice. poultice. That's right. I'm glad you would. Yeah. A poultice of figs. Now, I don't know how that worked. I mean, I don't know if there's any medicinal value in figs. I wish I'd known as a kid. <laughs> I could have used some. But nonetheless, he was healed. Got 15 more years out of it, too. Jonah, out of the fish's belly, in Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, God, Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Verse 10 says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Well, why didn't God answer his prayer when he prayed? Well, where would he spit him out then? Out in the middle of the ocean. He waited until he got to dry land. Now, we don't know that Jonah said, But wait till you get to this beach. You know, he didn't say that. This we don't know. Peter was released from prison. Uh, Acts chapter 12. Again, that prayer... Prayer meeting that the brethren had. Prayed for Peter all night long. 
Then when Peter showed up, knocked on the door, and a young woman came and thought he was a ghost and went back in. So, However, David didn't save his baby. He and Bathsheba had that baby by adultery. Baby didn't live. Paul didn't get rid of his thorn in the flesh. Although he prayed three times. Now, I, now I'm thinking if Paul was praying for something, he should get it. But God said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. Because neither result was God's will. It wasn't God's will that that baby live. An innocent child. Yeah, but it's an innocent child. Where do you think an innocent child is going to go? Okay. Um, Paul needed, probably Paul needed that thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Again, I don't know. That's just a spec. We don't even know what the thorn in the flesh was. Was it a physical condition? Was it a persecution of the Jews? We don't know. Good arguments on both sides of that issue. Now, God does, again, in the context of our lesson, God does answer every prayer. No prayer goes on unanswered. But it's yes, no, or wait a while. Now, our problem is, is that we don't know about the wait a while part. I've been praying for this for years, and I haven't gotten it yet. Wait a while. Or, or it's no. Or it's no. But we should pray. If there's something serious enough for us to pray about, let's pray. Now, I don't know how God answers prayer. And frankly, that's another one of those things it would be interesting to know. I'm just glad that he does. And I, and I have to tell you, at least in my life, there's a couple of times I, I can't attribute what happened other than the answer to my prayers. So, you know, um, again, that's just, that's just my own humble opinion about what took place in my life. But I don't have a better explanation. I don't think anybody else does either. But nonetheless, God tells us to pray. All that aside, whether those were actually answers to prayer or just circumstance, uh, the fact is, what has God told us to do? So pray without ceasing. So that's what we ought to do. Well, for anything, well, I don't know. Do you think, is it serious? Is it something you want? Is it a, and within God's will? Write it down and pray for it. And if God, if, I, if God doesn't want you to have that Mars bar, you're not going to get it. If God doesn't want you to, to have whatever it is, now, is it, occur, it occurs to me, he may say, that's not what I want you to have. Here it is. And it may not be what we've been praying for, but it is an answer to prayer. I guess I should put that in there. Note our text again, pray without ceasing. One who had or has a regular set time for prayer was said to do this. So if you have a regular time for prayer, and I don't mean saying grace, and I don't mean when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, which is good, I think you ought to. I, it's a practice, I, I encourage it. But I mean, do you have a, a prayer list? I showed you one this morning on the bulletin. And do you have a set time when you pray? I would suggest you do that. Um, there's, I read, read a bulletin or an article today about a congregation out in Texas that was having a prayer session for the brethren in Ukraine. I remember a couple years back we had a, we, we scheduled a 24-hour period of prayer. Um, I think that's a good thing to do. I, again, as I said down here, do you have a time and a list? You should. You've got the list. You've got the time. Now just schedule it. You know, just block out some time. So how does God re respond to the prayers of his people? In Matthew seven eleven, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts unto Give good things to them that ask him. And again, 1 John 5, 14, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Yes, no, not now. Rather, you're going to get this instead of what you're asking for. Because in my wisdom, Paul's prayer was answered. No. And what you have is what you ought to have. So we need to sometimes satisfy ourselves. No situation remains the same when it's prayed about. When you concentrate, it's like anything else in your life. When you concentrate on one particular thing, then it changes things. Sometimes it's a very subtle change. And sometimes in our life, we, we might get an answer to prayer, and we're not, we're not looking for that particular thing in that particular time in that particular area. Prayer, finally, then, is the means by which the power of the universe, God, is focused on one's needs. Now, God may well bless us whether we pray for something or not. 
But I have to believe that what I've read about prayer in the Bible and those praying, think about Abraham praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and God listened to him. And he was able to at least get Lot and his two daughters out. His wife almost made it out. Well, she didn't, bless you. She did make it out, but she turned to salt when she turned around and looked back. He apparently had some sons and sons and uh, daughters and daughter-in-laws and sons-in-laws that, nah, we'll be all right. And they didn't make it out because they didn't believe. So prayer is effective. Prayer, and we ought, to, we ought to pray. We really, truly ought to pray more than what we do. So, uh, Jesus' prayer for us before he died is that they, 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 they people listen to what the apostles had to say and then do it. So we're just simply asking you to help that prayer be answered. If you've not obeyed the gospel, and we all have, then I would say if you've not obeyed it, then do so. But since we all have, then I would progress on the next. If there's something that's keeping you from being faithful, then I would suggest you pray God and ask him to forgive you as you repent of that particular sin. If there's something in your life that we can pray with you about, that's what would be, we'd be glad to do that uh, and help you in any way along those spiritual ways. But if there's something we can help you with of a spiritual nature, then we invite you to come while together we stand and sing the hymn of invitation.